So, hello everybody. Um, I'm your host for today. My name is Helen Beale. I head up sales and marketing here at Midvision. Welcome to today's webcast. Um, it's a 60-minute webcast in three pieces. So the first part, Rob, who will introduce himself in a moment, is going to talk to us about the new Webster Application Server version 8.5 and the Liberty Profile Server. I'll by a 10-minute session with myself and Alex Manley, who's the lead architect here at Midvision. I'll talk to you a little bit about why a middleware upgrade project is often a good time to look at application release automation solutions. And then at the end, we're going to have a question and answer session. And we've kept that to the end because there's quite a few of you on the call today. Um, I've muted all as you've come in. So if you have questions uh, during the session, if you could privately send them to me by private chat. And if you'd like to speak to the presenters, I can unmute you at the end or I can just ask your questions for you. Uh, I should also mention to you that we are recording this webcast so that we can send it to people that have missed it and have it available for people to watch at their leisure. So I will pass over to Rob to introduce himself and his colleagues. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I, uh, thank you for your time and thank you to Helen for the opportunity to speak to you today um, about the latest version of the Web Server Application Server. I'm the uh, Client Technical Manager for UK Island for IBM. Uh, and uh, I cover a team of, um, of tech specialists to cover all of the WebSphere product. Um, and we have a couple of um, our lab experts from development on the call as well, Kathleen and Richard, who um, will be here to help answer the questions at the end um, and possibly chip in as we go along uh, if there's anything that I've said that needs expanding upon uh, and so on. But, uh, uh, we, we will leave time for questions to make sure that you get the most out of um, having X like that on the call. Uh, so to begin, quick overview of the agenda for my, my piece of this hour. Um, I just want to talk about where we are today with the app server, where we've come from. I am going to talk a little bit about uh, what's new in version 8 uh, and then spend quite a bit of time on what's new in 8.5, particularly the Liberty profile. Um, there are some of this which is specifically um, designed for uh, to be a benefit to developers and some of it that's designed to be a benefit to operations. So you'll be see, you'll probably be able to tell um, that we, we've had um, considerable focus on developers for the Liberty profile in particular as we go through that. Uh, so I won't spend too much time on Gen 8, uh, but I want to do a kind of catch up in case um, some people haven't had uh, an introduction to that before. I've got um, a couple of those as well to, to illustrate some of the points that the slides talk about and give you um, a bit of a, a break from the PowerPoint. So hopefully that will that will help to uh, paint a thousand words as it were um, and, and give you an idea of what this stuff actually looks like. So where we are today is that 8.5 is the latest GA release of the application server. Um, it includes this thing called the Lightweight Liberty Profile, uh, which um, I'm going to go into some detail on. But not the only thing which was included in 8.5. It also has something called Intelligent Management, which if you've run into uh, the, the product WebSphere Virtual Enterprise before is pretty much analogous to that. So it gives you a lot of the capabilities that were in VE. I have a, a slide on some of those. Um, and then finally, to give Liberty, uh, we use the um, RVA 7 uh, SDK. Uh, so you are able to use the capabilities in that. If we go back to version 8, uh, that was our first release, full release of um, JEE6 support um, and came out in 2011. Uh, so you, you can see that things in the atmosphere world pretty much move on uh, on an annual basis. You'll see a major release from IBM. At the moment, we have uh, what is code 8.5 next. Uh, in alpha, which is something that you can buy now and um, and contribute to uh, contribute enhancement requests for publicly and i 'll go into that a little bit later on as well so, um, 
So in version 8, we, uh, we included a lot of enhancements. So as well as general performance improvements across the board, uh, actually before we, we introduced JE6 support, uh, we, we brought in some of the feature packs which we'd, uh, we'd brought out that worked on 7. So on the agency, we've got OSGI, SCA, the Java Batch engine, uh, and uh, the um, communication enabled applications. So uh, a number of things were integrated into the core product, and then some new feature packs that came along as well, because um, we make sure with the feature packs that we deliver capabilities quickly uh, to clients as, uh, as soon as we're able to, without necessarily having to go through, having them go through a full upgrade to a new major release of the product. So at that point, we, we also brought out the Web2 and Mobile feature pack um, and the Dynamic Scripting feature pack, both of which are extremely popular. Uh, there were some enhancements to the availability uh, cases of the product. It over to, to using the IBM Installation Manager, which has a number of uh, advantages in terms of both remote installation, centralized uh, installation control, and uh, being able to support multiple IBM products from all the different software brands. So um, that was a unification, if you like, of your control of your IBM software installs. Um, we reduced the overhead of logging and tracing uh, using HPEL. Uh, introduced um, a feature called Node Recovery that lets you bring up a new app server which effectively inherits its um, configuration from one which has died, so a disaster recovery scenario. Uh, tightened up the default security and, uh, and finally we enhanced the migration toolkit. That's been available since version 7 and we, we improved that. Uh, there'll be a bit more on that as well later on. And the customers that went through uh, the uh, beta program with us gave us extremely positive feedback on their migration experience to 8 and what it delivered for them. So uh, pretty much uh, universally, the, the migrations went smoothly, applications ran as is, um, automation and scripting worked as is without without having to change anything. So. There, there were a number of very successful migrations, and we've seen um, customers doing the same since uh, with, who, who weren't necessarily on the beta program. So the experience um, we've heard from our clients has been generally very positive. Um, the, uh, towards the bottom there, a uh, comment that was, eight was the most stable version one of these clients ever tested. Sorry, I can't remember which, which one of those that was. Um, and, and the platforms being used uh, were across the board from AIX to NX to so uh, there were a number of different environments that we ensured we tested this on. So moving to point five, um, there are enhancements in three categories really. Again, uh, developer experience, which is the one we'll be focusing on for the rest of the presentation, which has been made theme for 8.5. Um, so anything more about that now as we're coming back to that. The uh, application resiliency, the intelligent management capabilities that I mentioned earlier on. So you can now do things like uh, intelligent routing and dynamic clustering so that you can fire up JVMs hosting a new instance of an application if the demand for that application soars and you need more uh, more cores and more memory allocated to it. Um, you can you can run multiple versions of the same application at the same time to make upgrades uh, in place and easier, as well as uh, perhaps you know testing testing a certain subset of the user base on a new version of the application because you want to uh, to understand how it performs or what what uh, what kind of um, reception that gets from a, a certain subset of users before you roll it out to everybody. Um, some improvements in the messaging infrastructure, um, uh, the apps, uh, and and finally some uh, bettering of many situations so that we we uh, we clean up better crashed um, application and don't leave lots of memory being used up. Uh, and then finally for operations, 
you can uh, you can choose which JDK you use for any individual node. You can uh, you can you had a WebSphere patch um, in eight, but there have been some enhancements to that. Uh, I think uh, um, you know, in terms of uh, working with IBM support, um, that's been improved. The support assistant that you can download to help you analyze um, config files and so on has been improved, and there's uh, again better log and base filtering to help you get to the things that actually are the, the root cause of any issues. So, if on to the developer enhancements, there, there's pr I'm not sure that um, everybody we speak to fully <coughs> understands the, the sort of WebSphere apps family. So I just wanted to include this to, to put in, in one picture. Um, Hand side, developers can use WAS for um, effectively for unit tests and for for workstation use free as as any um, place as they want to. Uh, and there there is a set of tools that enable that within Eclipse that you can download uh, for free. Um, then there's um, uh, five versions of WAS. Uh, that you pay for. So WAS Express, which is designed for a uh, small medium business. Um, WAS, what is really called base, uh, but officially is just the WebSphere application server, uh, which um, uh, which has um, capabilities as Express, the same code base, uh, and all the dark purple boxes have the same code base, are fully binary compatible. But it's uh, it doesn't have restrictions on the scale that you're allowed to use it at, that Express does. Then uh, you move up to the uh, enterprise um, capabilities in hypervisor edition and, and net deployment, which allow you to do things like clustering. And, and finally, there is the specific version for ZOS, which, uh, which is pretty much the same as ND, but taking advantage of some of the platform benefits that we get from the mainframe. So the, the uh, WAS Community Edition at the bottom you'll see is not in dark purple. Uh, it's a different binary, but obviously a, a JEE compliant application can run on that as well. And it's freely available for anybody to use, whether for development, test, or production for any size organization. Um, so that is the full family. You can see, as well as the, uh, the, the developer edition having these tools that you can download and run in Eclipse, there, uh, there's also a tools edition of uh, and App Server ND, and what that gives you is a license for the server as it normally does, plus some enhanced developer tools um, that you can use to build applications that go uh, beyond just being able to, to sort of run the core server. So um, you can see the sort of spectrum of these things. You get the WAS for developers at the bottom. Um, the tools edition, which uh, includes the uh, the server uh, for production use, and then the uh, WAS ND tools edition at the top that has the clustering and everything else, um, and that obviously includes support and everything else that the free download for the developer edition doesn't. Now we also obviously have, I say obviously, also have the rational application developer premium offering for. Um, application development, and this diagram is intended to show what that offers that you don't get with the freely, either the freely downloaded tools or with license and support tools editions of the app server. So we've we've basically tried to include in the, in those tools editions the, the most common set of web application capabilities that people use. So a lot of developers can can develop for WAS. Using um, using that set of capabilities, and then as you can see, under the premium offering thing, you get a lot of the um, sort of development lifecycle tools that Rational offer, uh, and and so that's what that license buys you. Moving on to the the actual capabilities of the Liberty profile in particular, we looked at what differs want to be able to do what they needed from a, a test application server uh, that they would be running on their workstation and the kinds of things they did and how often they did them. And as you, as you look down the list, um, 
be the first one developers do on a second by second basis. But even going down to um, installing a server, that might be something that they'll, they'll want to do um, on a reasonably regular basis. Uh, so we've we've tried to enhance their experience across that entire list. Um, and in, in the sort of operations world, uh, things like provisioning of, um, of servers, et cetera, is a far more um, common process. So the tooling on that side has been enhanced to support that as well. But for the developer, we've tried to make those things that they regularly do as fast and productive as possible. So it includes uh, the fact that very small download, you can get the Liberty profile for the for, for app server in a, I think it's 46 megabyte download. Um, and I'll show you on the video in a second uh, that that's very simple and quick experience. It, it has a dynamic runtime engine, so if your application needs a component um, that isn't currently running in the app server, it will dynamically add that component into the engine and then restart your application. So the, 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 the developer has a lot less to worry about when they're configuring the server and, and getting their test environment um, working. And, and on an ongoing basis as they enhance their application. Um, it's compatible with the full profile of app service. So you can take an application that's developed on Liberty and it will run on ZND full profile. Um, we've, we've allowed you to choose your JDK when you're, when you're deploying one of these servers so that, uh, for example, uh, you can run it on a Mac as well as on various flavors of Windows JDK or on Linux. And a um, couple of other things on here. Uh, being a small download, obviously, it's also um, got a small memory footprint when it's running, so it um, it starts very, very quickly. In fact, uh, if, you, if you're doing a basic web application that just uses servlets, you, you're talking about a couple of seconds of load time. Um, and even if you load the entire runtime with all the, the optional components, um, you're probably not looking at more than about 10 to 15 seconds. So it can run, uh, restart if you need to restart it extremely quickly. Um, and the uh, installation and deployment of the actual server can be packaged up with just a bunch of files, which allows the sort of automated scripting and deployment of an application to be much easier, uh, and I think Alex is going to talk, talk a bit, a bit more about later on. So, uh, just to show you some examples of that, um, this is a couple of screenshots from Eclipse, uh, from the Eclipse Marketplace, where you get the Liberty profile uh, downloaded freely, and it's not very really big. You can also get it from a site called wasdev.net, uh, that uh, is the, the place that the alpha is being run as well. If you want to have a look at the latest version. Um, and I'll just show you, rather than just use the screenshots, I'll just show you the video from the start. I'll pause this a couple of times. Um, hopefully, this will be okay across the webcast. Um, this, this particular Eclipse client has got an application in it that uh, the, the developers just chosen to run. They haven't installed it yet, so they're defining a new server using that profile, but there isn't actually a, a server installed and running um, at the moment. So they, they're going to install a new one. They downloaded the code already, just, just we didn't have to wait for it, but it's, um, it's not there anyway. And then uh, after accepting the terms of the license agreement, they choose where they want to install the, the server to. Um, and I think there's one more step where it's given a name. Okay. The bike being expanded to the folder. At this point, you choose which version of the JRE you want to use. And it's um, six or above, by the way. Once the, the binaries are laid down, you, you set up the uh, the named server instance on top of that, so you give it a surname. And that's it, hit finish, and you'll see that the server starts 
and launches the application in just a few seconds, and there, that's the application running. Um, it's so very quick to download, install, uh, and run. Just move that to slideshow. So, uh, a little more on that server configuration. You'll see a couple of times in the video, actually, this, this is shown as well. The, the entire configuration for the server is held in this one file, and it uses this concept of intelligent defaults. So there's only what, five lines of configuration here to say which features uh, are being used. And in this case, we've just got a, a couple um, of defaults like the SP engine um, and uh, the what's called the local connector, which is a um, JMX engine to allow you to talk to the application and, and manage it. And then uh, some ports defined for the server uh, and then the application itself is going to be run, and, and that's it. There is no other config anywhere. It's just this one file. So while uh, this is this is intended to make life very very simple for developers, you can use that in production as well. You can you can use this simplicity of configuration if you want to uh, for a for, for a production application. Um, so this is a little bit more detail about those things that I just mentioned, and this example here has also has a data source name defined in it. Uh, so you may want to, if you have multiple developers working um, on on a single application or instance, you may want to share configuration uh, across applications, or you may want to have multiple people contributing to the single configuration of a server. So you can do that as well. You can, and it will. Um, it will do some quite things in the tooling to bring in those configuration snippets uh, dynamically, and I'll show you that in the video in a second. So, let's switch back to that. Second piece. You can see that's the, um, the file we were just looking at in, in the slide deck. Tooling gives you a graphical view onto that as well, so you don't need to know exactly what you have to put in, in that XML. It defaults to a sensible set anyway, but in here um, you can see you get drop-downs, etc., to be able to modify that configuration if you don't want to edit the file directly. And then uh, that's the feature list that was in there with the two features uh, that you saw. And when you click on Add, those features that you can incrementally add to it if you want to do that manually but as I said it will do dynamically too um, and uh, and basically those that set of features as of 8.5 are um, JPA, OSGI, web applications and security components. So we just move forward. Anything in you can see that the servlet it knows that it needs other components as well. Um, so in, in you can see the the file for the um, definition is held uh, with the server and can be edited there and everything else. Um, you'll see in a second uh, you can so have it dynamically update that when it needs to. Uh, oh, excuse me. Back to the show. So, uh, there are a few miscellaneous things in here that I've, um, I've, I've put in because I think they're of interest, um, but we won't have videos for all of them. So one thing you can choose to do is uh, have a drop-in application deployment. So you can take your, your application and just copy it to a file system and the server will see it uh, and start running it. Uh, there is a, an important concept around class visibility, uh, which is designed to um, make life for uh, developers. So in the normal full profile server, all of the classes in the server, so all of the full uh, spec, all of the IBM classes, and the open source libraries that we've used are visible to applications. So uh, if if somebody chooses to use one of those, if, it, if it's in the spec or if it's in the IBM API, then that's going to, well, that is going to be fine. 
because uh, on an ongoing basis that will be um, backwardly compatible and so on. But there are times when you may have an open source library in there that uh, exists within the WebSphere app server, an application doesn't include it itself and it uses the one that's in there and then in the future something changes in the uh, in that particular library uh, and the version that we're using is newer or older than the version the application was expecting or something like that and you run into issues or you have two applications that need different versions you run into problems there so by the liberty profile will hide um, classes uh, from from runtime except for the spec and for IBM APIs you can choose to override that and tell it to also show the third-party ones, um, but it's, I think it's far likely that people will want to bundle those third-party um, classes in with their applications so that they know exactly what they're going to get. A uh, simplification that's happened is that things like libraries, again, could be controlled with a simple XML file. So as you can see here, you can, you can choose to have a library, you can share classes, is between applications or you can say for your application you want to have just your own uh, instance of a particular class. So the, the comparison graphically between the full server and the Liberty profile is that um, full, full Java EE uh, and Liberty has uh, this subset which covers most of the common web application implementations we see people using. Um, but it's noticeable, so you, you can have a tiny runtime uh, if that suits your application, making everything much um, quicker and more nimble, particularly for the developer. And then on top of that, specifically for, uh, for ZOS, there are a few components to handle traction, security, workload management. So there are some specific components that we also provide with Liberty for running on Z to take advantage of some of the platform specifics. Okay, our last little segment of video. In this, in this instance, uh, we have another application on the same server. It says we've got a deliberate uh, mistake we've made when, when putting this together. So the first time it's run, of things actually the first thing uh, you can just see here is the application can't be started um, and it's because it, it, the, the server as it was configured didn't include um, BC so the server notices that and it actually installs as you can see here JBC and JNDI and then um, restarts the application so we didn't have to change the configuration of the server to do that, it did it dynamically, um, and then runs it. However, having run it, it discovers there's, there's a problem. So uh, one of the nice things to talk about here is that the, when the exception's thrown, it shows you a much, much more slimmed down stack trace so you see exactly where the problem was that it's run into. And it also makes the, the uh, messages there link that will jump you straight to the code so you can see exactly where the error was that you've, you've uh, caught. So in this case, it's, um, it's the fact that the data source that's being named isn't available. Uh, so the following takes the uh, into the, uh, to the code at that point. Lies so just was missing exception. Um, so what they've done is they've got a um, server configuration. They have that server XML we talked about, and there is no data source name defined in that. So they've uh, they've pre-prepared a little snippet of configuration to find that data source. Uh, you see the server added JDBC4 there at the top, uh, which wasn't in it before. Uh, so that's done automatically, but it can't know where, what the data source name should be pointing at. So um, if we give it a couple more seconds, um, that's just what I spoke about already. Um, 
So they, and uh, in their resources, they have this data source they've they've defined, um, and you can so you separate configuration snippets which you can take and apply to the server dynamically. Um, so the, the, the runtime, there is this space called the shared configuration where you can just drop these things from directly from the uh, source. And by that piece of that snippet onto the server, the, it, will, it will dynamically apply that particular snippet to the server without um, having to restart it. Uh, and you now have that data source name available and you'll see if they, they just go back and rerun it it's automatically included that file it hasn't copied the definition across but it's included that, that snippet file and then when we run the application it works um, and gives them the interface they're rejecting so um, imagine that, that being very quick and easy especially if a team of developers working against a single server configuration and one person needs to change something for themselves but they don't want to affect what anybody else is doing some other things, uh, there's um, some Maven integration, which has been uh, specifically added into Liberty to control it. And um, just in a, in a sort of graphical representation, so you have the, uh, you have the SDK, uh, the server, if you like, is made up of the SDK, the Liberty profile itself, uh, and then the application and the server configuration. You can wrap all those together in a, a single zip file and deploy them um, automatically across to, uh, in this instance, the illustration is supposed to show um, a number of uh, kind of WAS-based servers. You can you do some uh, sort of HTTP level clustering, load sharing across uh, Liberty Profile servers, um, but isn't the same as the full WebSphere network deployment clustering capability. Last couple of things to comment on is um, there is a, a local and a REST interface to uh, GEMX within Liberty so that you, you can uh, you can probe what's going on in the server and control it in the application. Um, and then there's also some monitoring that's, that's included, which pull in uh, another thing that are the typical kind of uh, runtime monitoring you would need to do. So some screenshots here of that. Uh, so we've got particular ones uh, for heap uh, into the thread pool and what's happening there. Um, Serve statistics. So there's things which um, which you get uh, out of the box and um, the, the, the security components that I mentioned earlier on, it's intended to be locked down out of the box. Uh, so it, it has almost not from HTTP available as default when you start the, um, the server. And you can see that by default it's local host only and that applies to um, the local connection for JMX as well. Uh, and the three things on there, you need SSL for most web applications, um, the authentication pieces in there. You have a number of choices about how you do that as well. And uh, and then finally, the specifics around uh, security. So some, uh, some statistics and numbers. And I'll come back to the, the WASA performance in this bit as well. Um, the goal was to get Liberty to, to start up and, uh, and take up as much memory approximately as Tomcat. And you can see uh, in this chart here, a little bit more than Tomcat by maybe half a second or something, um, and uses a little bit more memory, but not by much. So uh, we've carried very close to lightweight Tomcat engine in terms of how um, how quickly this thing can be run and restarted by developers. Um, and the things there you can see we're on a fairly low spec machine. It's uh, an old Lenovo T60P, which is at least sort of five or six years old now. Um, the, uh, the performance is very good, faster than the other app servers that we tested it against, uh, and, and uh, on a, on a pro server, but um, uh, it's all relative, of course. Uh, so again, that was something that we had to maintain while um, slim server done as much as possible for developers. And then finally, the, the 8.5 core itself uh, is very high.
high performance. You can see the comparison there to App Server 8. Uh, there, there's a change in uh, Dell architecture between the um, seven and eight steps there. So they tried to do the same benchmark on on Lemon and the Westmere cores, and um, and then so you can get a reasonable comparison with the 8.5 performance. So as you can see. Performance was improved a bit by moving from an 8-core Nehalem to 12-core Westmere, but uh, improved an awful lot um, with 8.5. So, as with the other releases, as you can see going back there to, to 7, we constantly try and push what we can do in terms of the uh, the performance of the server. And a new benchmark published just last week, I think, um, that reinforced that uh, with a, a new, again, a new processor chipset. Sort of coming back to the diagram that I had earlier on, you can run the file in any of the the WAS sort of configurations. But your um, you, you unless you you know if you're not running full profile, you don't get the full JE capability and you don't get the full ND um, clustering and so on. But uh, you it's compatible with all those different uh, environments uh, and with the edition with ND and with the Z version, you also get this intelligent management with the dynamic routing, the ability to have application editioning for seamless upgrades and so on. If you want to get involved in where this goes next, there's, a, uh, there's an open alpha running on uh, dev.net uh, and there's also a request for enhancements um, uh, in general on the IBM Support sites where uh, any you can ask for you know enhancements to the full profile product as well. Um, so that the the lightweight um, developer focused Liberty profile is a key part of 8.5, but it's not the only part. There are other enhancements too, particularly around as you saw performance and the intent management. And um, anybody can download the developer tools. Anybody can develop applications and test them on a WAS, uh, WAS set. Uh, for free, and if you buy the tools edition of the um, of the edition server itself, you can also get support for as many developers as you want. Um, this new package server deployment model, where we wrap this thing all up as a set of files, and, um, and finally, uh, the, the the next what we do with this next is um, as, as open to anybody's contribution from the community as well as what IBM thinks is the right thing to do. And that's just a screenshot of that request for enhancement site that I was talking about. So I think that's my 40 minutes done. I'll, um, I hope that was interesting and useful. I'll hand back to, to Helen now. And um, as, as she mentioned, we'll have questions and answers at the end. Thanks much, Rob. So Rob said we're just going to do 10 minutes, Alex and I now, on hardware upgrade projects and whether this is a good time to introduce application release automation. So I should pass over to Alex. Hello, I'm Alex Manley. Uh, I'm a um, chief architect here at uh, Midvision. We uh, specialise in ARA uh, um, application deployment, um, which I'm going to talk to you a bit about today. So, um, as you heard from Rob, um, IBM have done some great work with simplifying the configuration of um, of the WAS Liberty profile, and um, you can simply now just use one file to edit the configuration. You can push your applications into uh, directories and they automatically get deployed. But what, what you're missing in, in the enterprise is uh, having um, the uh, deployments audited, um, having, uh, okay, so I'll this slide here. So having peered uh, and consistent deployments. If you look at ARA, you basically have developers that would put their uh, code into the SCM. Uh, the SCM may be integrated into a build system, such as Hudson, uh, Ant, Maven, which would build. And there you get your EAR file or your WAR file, which then put into your definitive software library, such as R3, Nexus, or even Maven as a, as a VSL. And um, we can use uh, tools such as Rapploy or IBM RAF to then push these uh, deployments out uh, to all of your different target servers. And you can do them in a consistent manner, and you can do them securely, 
um, with the same configuration to each different element. So if you take an example of a simple application, which has a data source and a couple of uh, MQ, uh, MQ uh, queues to talk to, you, you'd test it in development, then you'd uh, point into the database in one set of queues, you get all from the test manager, it's okay, you then move it into the next test environment, which then have a different data source, a different set of queues. So the only thing that's really changed in that configuration is the endpoints. And using a tool like Rapid Deploy or IBM RAF, you could tokenize this, uh, this configuration and push it out from one environment to another. So if we just go on to the next slide. Oh, we go back one, sorry. Yeah. What we're saying is you can take one package from development which has one set of server configuration, which may have um, a data source and two queues, and if the release, um, the deployment configuration for each individual environment. So you'll have a data source definition for your development environment, a data source definition for your test environment, QA staging, production. And what you're doing is you're taking the same single package and you're just applying the different values depending on which, um, which uh, environment it, you're deploying to. So uh, you're ensuring you've you've tested the set, whatever you've tested in QA or staging is the same uh, application you've tested in deployment. Uh, sorry, the development environment because the application and the configuration hasn't changed. It's only the only the individual settings, the endpoints that have actually changed. So, uh, so the good about the Liberty profile is because there is one file for the configuration, or or there could be multiple files. We can take our tool and tokenize uh, this file so that it's uh, environment agnostic, uh, and then you just have your different uh, dictionary files we call them uh, pointing to your different environments. And this. Uh, and it, way you're ensuring you've got consistency in deployment. And also using a tool, you can have the um, uh, the deployments purely uh, deployed. Only uh, certain people who are, have access to the target systems can deploy. You have um, uh, uh, deployments audited, so you can see who deployment, when they did the deployment, how long it took. Uh, and you have the ability to... Um, Plug deployments into um, uh, an orchestration flow uh, where you could spin up your um, your VM or your cloud server on demand. You can deploy your WAS Liberty Profile server with its configuration, with the application, do your testing, and then sit down to it again. So, um, you often get asked is, when is the best time to do an application release automation? The best time, really, is when you're considering going from one uh, version of the technology to the other. Um, so I'd just like to talk, before I go on to that, I'd just also like to talk, with the Liberty Profile, um, it, I mean, you can deploy it into production. However, um, you might want to have a full set of clustering uh, support, the, the, the support you get in your ND or VE profile. So Developers would often use the liberty to do the quick development and testing, and maybe you t test in development environment, maybe a couple of test environments. But at some point, if you're going to go into a fully blown enterprise uh, environment with high availability servers and everything, you'll want to transfer the configuration from your liberty profile into your uh, ND or VE profile. Um, and having a tool that can uh, move this configuration from one profile to the other. Uh, it's quite useful. I'll, I'll move you on to Helen now, who can talk about when is a good time to to upgrade. Thank you very much, Alex. So I'll start by talking a little bit about the application release automation maturity scale, because every single customer that we talk to has looked at this in, to some extent. So some people are doing their releases um, entirely manually, although I'd say that's fairly rare um, these days. And then the next slide is that people have built some scripts and written some scripts, often in Ant and Jython, also in some other languages. And then we move along the maturity 
scale, some people have built very extensive scripting. Um, they have script libraries and things like that. People have built some tooling around their script libraries. So they may have built some um, user interfaces, some portal-based user interfaces, so that they can do things like self-service and secure um, around role-based ac role based access. They may have documented some processes around this. And then kind of at the, the ultimate um, mature of the um, maturity scale would be that they've purchased and implemented a vendor-supported tool. And a few of you filled out a survey that I sent out a few days ago, which was um, very kind of the that managed to do that and know where you're on that. And, and we do see quite a few customers that have done quite a lot of work in-house, um, but we're still seeing people recognising that there might be an advantage in getting a vendor-supported solution um, since, you know, we have a, a global customer base of people that are contributing their ideas and their, their requirements into our product development roadmap on a daily basis. So that's kind of maturity scale. And then what we see um, with customers, um, there's kind of a decision point where they make the choice that it's time to make the investment in this type of tool. Um, there's often a competitive event that goes with it rather than just kind of deciding it's time to get an ARA tool. And those compelling events can be things like starting a PaaS project, um, re-architecting a web environment from an AS400 platform to Solaris, um, building a new data um, a disaster recovery architecture. But one of the most common is the middleware upgrade project. And lots of customers use um, WAS in combination with other middleware products from VM and other vendors. And this we have seen is a really good time um, when you're planning an upgrade project to think about how you're going to do it and what the world's going to look like after your upgrade's completed. So a tool like this has kind of the immediate advantage of, of making your upgrade project faster and the ongoing advantage of making your middleware infrastructure estate easier to manage moving forward. So it makes your life easier after your upgrade as well. I'm going to move on to the question and answer session now. I'm just going to come out the presentation for a moment and flip back to the chat because we have had um, quite a few questions, so if you just bear with me, um, we'll just start at the top. So, presenters, are you ready for the questions? Sure, go for it. Rob? Yep. Excellent, thank you. Right. So, um, in lots of banks and investment banks, the um, implementation manager, the installation manager, manager, installation manager, forgive me, is problematic without access to the internet. Is there a way of installing WAS 8.5 without the IM, bearing in mind there's lots of servers in the DMZ zone? Well, I can answer that. I mean, uh, we, with the Rapid Deploy tool, we actually um, uh, deploy remotely. We, we package the repositories that contain the software, which would contain uh, WAS, including the profiles, and we actually use the installation manager um, to uh, uh, deploy to the and install on the remote targets. So there is the initial. Uh, someone has to go and download the repository um, so that you've got it local, but then we package that repository and that's what then gets deployed to a target server. I don't know if there's other native ways of doing it using the installation manager to do that. Maybe Rob or the team could have that. Yeah, I don't know if Castle Rich wants to comment on that. I'm just wondering um, uh, whether the, the comment about the DMZ is. Uh, because remote deploy is going to then be dependent on uh, what access the, the sort of installation manager machine has to the endpoints and, and may be locked down when you're going from inside the corporate network to the DMZ as much as it is from the other side. I've taken you off mute if you wanted to add anything, or we can move on to the next question if you're happy with that. So basically, this DMZ is where you know it's for an internet banking or an investment banking application, like, like a monitoring application, where it's locked down, where you have three or four zones, and we constantly have this problem with a local repository for the installation manager. So we've had this problem with manager and process service 7 um, and we've got her on it in other words I was just wondering is there a way we could get away with not having the installation manager 
Yes, I think. Well, no, using the AI tool will do what they're doing, and they actually have a local repository that we push out and use. Uh, but I think what Sandra is saying is, you know, it's kind of a way of having your repository on every individual target server. So right. Could, can you install the product without using installation management? So one possibility with the Liberty profile is to um, package your server image um, using the um, 8.5 ND job manager and then distribute that um, image to um, machines. So you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't have a Liberty profile in your production or your pre-production environment. You're fully clustered, fully available. So you wouldn't have a Liberty profile in your production environment. Well, you, you can go into production on the Liberty profile, but I guess obviously if that doesn't meet your topology needs, then yeah, it wouldn't be an option. So I, I, I guess um, if I take that question away, yeah. yeah, in terms of the full profile WAVs, what options there may be, and then come back by you, Got another, sorry to be a bit quiet then, we've just got another question that Alex was just reading which is sort of linked. Do, do we want to share this one with the group now or is this part of the uh, Yeah, away? it's about using the Liberty Profile uh, and migrating it to the full ND type deployment. Uh, and it's saying, so does this mean no advantage by the time you get to the installation of the enterprise environment to Liberty, the, the footprint is not reduced? Um, well, you can use Liberty Profile in your production environments. I guess it depends on uh, what the application is, uh, what you're using it for. Um, but I, I know from my experience that um, uh, I guess Liberty Profiles new. I guess this is a question for the IBM team. Um, there are many cu customers using the Liberty Profile in, in their production environment. So I'll take an initial shot of that. Um, you certainly uh, you can use as you, as you mentioned earlier on you can use it in production as long as the qualities of service that you need are um, are appropriate for it. So there's there's no reason why somebody um, somebody couldn't get the benefits of the lightweight uh, thing. And we've certainly got clients um, who, when last had the conversation, are looking at doing that in order to. Um, to take some applications and consolidate them onto uh, servers um, that are just smaller. So taking a, a bunch of applications that don't need the full WAS capabilities and putting them and, and consolidating them together onto a smaller infrastructure. Um, whether you know how far they are down the road with that, right now I don't know. Um, so it's intended that you can do that. If you uh, translate, if you like, to a full as bendy full profile um, configuration, then yeah, you you are still going to be running the full server, so um, you wouldn't you can get the lightweight memory footprint and the the fast restart. Basically, you you know you decide which one suits exactly what you need for per application basis really. You've got to remember that uh, I think a lot of this Liberty Profile, uh, the requirements stand out of um, you know being aimed at the developer because it's it's about as a number a developer for 15 years and you know when you make changes to code and then you've got to redeploy something previously with WAV six and seven you'd be sitting twiddling your thumbs for a couple of minutes waiting for it to redeploy so so you know having a developer can just make a change and you can see it instantly within you know three four five seconds. Um, that's where you're getting a huge benefit, I'd say. Okay, guys. Um, the next two questions I think might be slightly linked, but I'll ask them separately anyway. Um, the first one is, are the M beans clustered? So I guess it's the management interface. Um, that um, I can take the person that asked that question off of uh, because they're not here anymore. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know if um, Kathleen or Richard. Good question with that, then. Um, can you cluster Liberty profiles together? 
So there's a question here which does Liberty Profile support session clustering? Uh, so the, the Liberty Profile can um, be also have the same clustering as um, the full profile ND. You can um, manage um, a number of instances of Liberty Profile using the ND job manager. Uh, so you can distribute um, HTTP requests. Uh, across those um, Liberty Profile servers to uh, to workload manage. Uh, there's um, some, uh, replication um, for that as well. And I believe that uh, we support session clustering uh, with an in-memory Extreme Dale or XC10 implementation. But I think that's not um, using the other other methods of um, uh, session persistence. Okay, I, I will get confirmation on that. And I, but I think that's the, that's the case. That was great. Thanks, Rob. And um, I was asked this question earlier as well. And I, we will be sending this um, recording out to you all. It will probably come out to you around next Tuesday or Wednesday. So we'll send everybody a link, um, and I can put what Rob sent out into that same email with the link. At the end of the questions, um, we've been sent. Um, so I think we're done today. Thank you very much to Rob and the team from Hursley. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you.